Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this week's Forgotten Feminists. Today, our host, or not our host, our guest is the lovely Hannah. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Yasmin. Um, so you have a huge crowd of people here today that want to hear all about your story. So let's start from the very beginning. Um, let's take it back to little baby Hannah growing up in the U.S. to Moroccan parents. Now, you did you do that whole first generation bridging thing where you're kind of feeling like, am I American? Am I Moroccan? Am I Arab? Am I Muslim? Tell me about that whole, um, I'm assuming maybe a bit of an internal struggle there or? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was born and raised here in the United States but both of my parents are Moroccan immigrants. So growing up, I had this uh, dichotomy going on. I My home life was Moroccan, but outside of the house, it was primarily being within American society and uh, being surrounded by American ideals. Um, the way I like to describe, I guess, my the clash of cultures um, is more in the sense of I guess for me, I guess my, the clash for me was more in the sense of a crisis for, of conscience. I, I did not have a super extreme uh, experience when it comes to being a Muslim, having Islam forced on me. Um, luckily, my parents were very good with that. Um, they didn't necessarily force me to pray. They didn't force me to wear the hijab like my own many of my female family members don't even wear the hijab for me it was more of hey I have these things that I don't necessarily agree with but I I still have to call myself a Muslim because that's the only option and there were just some things that just didn't necessarily make sense to me um, being here in the United States and then going back home to Morocco I started realizing that um, I'm very lucky to have been born and raised here in the States. I started realizing that we have so many rights and privileges that back home, back in Morocco, back in these Islamic theocracies, the people do not have. And I, I guess having this bicultural experience really opened my eyes. It, it allowed me to realize that some things aren't right in the world and that we need change, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me about some of the things that you saw in Morocco that made you realize that? Like, was it something to do with maybe the gender issues like men and women and how they're treated differently or free expression? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely say the first thing I noticed were the extreme gender roles and the honor culture. Um, for me, I, I, I was the youngest in my family, so I was, I was treated as the favorite. Um, for me, the, I guess in that sense, the gender roles didn't really apply to me, but as, as one that would sit back and observe, I realized that things didn't make sense. It could be something as simple um, as watching um, all my female cousins have to get up and do work and chores around the house and my male cousins do whatever the hell they want, which I know this, this goes across other cultures. Or it could be as extreme or not as extreme, but a little bit higher um, as my, my male cousins getting, <laughs> getting away with any potential sins um, mm -hmm. such as, you know, drinking, smoking, um, the, the aunts and uncles knew they were sexually active, but if, but if one of my female cousins were to have drink or smoke or exposed as not a virgin, that would have been the end of the world. It was just seeing, seeing that perspective, seeing the inequality. And to me being, having been born and raised in the United States, and traveling there and seeing this was was new to me. We didn't have that that inequality within my American experience. It's just going to school. You were a female. You're a male. We're treated equally. It doesn't matter. We we have 
equal opportunities, we have equal roles, but going back in Morocco and seeing how culture treated women and men differently just really, really took a mark on me. Yeah, I bet. I bet that was that was pretty jarring for you. Um, so when you were in America, I mean, I'm glad that your sounds like your parents are, you know, pretty open minded, progressive, you know, liberal people. Um, did, but did you interact with any Muslims? Like, was there a Muslim community that you interacted with in the States or? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that also, I guess, the bicultural experience even happened geographically within the United States. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a, where I'm at, where, where I grew up, there was a big um, Moroccan population, Arab population, and just in general, Muslim population. So I did get to go to the mosque a couple of times. And that, <laughs> I would say that was a transformational experience, more in the sense that I never wanted to go again. Oh. I, <laughs> I realized that this was complete and utter, excuse my French, but bullshit. Um, I, as a child, I, I saw that this wasn't right. I saw that the woman and the kids were placed in this small, tiny room in the back. Yep. And the men were just uh, privileged in, the main doors. in this large main yeah. room, air conditioned, so nice, so beautiful. And then we'd have to navigate to the back of the mosque in this small, tiny room. And I was like, mm -hmm this doesn't make sense. And I don't like this. You're treating me differently based on something that I can't change on something that I didn't choose. I didn't choose to be born a female. I was born a female. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I, I don't know. I was just like, I guess that was one of, that was one of the starting points. Um, um, and I, and I periodically questioned my, my parents about these, these things as I grew up. Um, I was like, this didn't make sense to me. It's not fair that that's the women and children were thrown in the back of the mosque and the men got to do whatever they had, whatever they wanted. And even goes back to the hijab. Like, why is it that women have to cover up? Why don't men cover up as well? Why is it just, why is it, why is this one-sided? It never really made sense to me. And it's those little things like that, that just kept adding up and instilling the seed of doubt. And it's just learning that, uh, a Muslim man can marry a woman of any denomination, but a Muslim woman has to marry a Muslim man. And it, it's just things like that didn't make sense to me. It wasn't fair. And inheritance, oh, <laughs> inheritance really like took the, took the beat out of me. Like it was just how, why is it that the man gets more, gets a greater portion than the, than the, than the, than the woman? Like mm -hmm. it, it didn't make sense to me. It was just like so much inequality, so much gender inequality. And I was just constantly in this, in, I guess, in the state of doubt, but not in the sense that I would ever denounce the religion. These were things that I just simply did not agree with. So they were kept at the back of my mind. And I really considered myself as like someone who would fight for equality, someone who upholds equality. And it's just like, at that time, I was still Muslim because there wasn't even an option of leaving Islam. Mm -hmm. um, but, but throughout my childhood, these little things were ingrained in me. Like, it's not right that there's inequality. And so you just push those things to the back of your mind. And, and so you didn't like question them or, you know, try to poke and prod and find it from your parents or from your mosque or from the put on or hadith, you just kind of put it away and said, well, that's not me. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I would ask. And the only, the only response I would get from my parents is that's just the way it is. That's, that's the way God made it. And that's what we need to, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to follow. And to me, <laughs> that was an unacceptable answer. That was yeah. absolutely unacceptable. I'm a very logical person and telling me that that's just the way it is, is not enough for me. I need data. I need evidence. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. I need to know why he would create people so mm -hmm. unequally like this. What that was my question to my mom when I was a kid. Like, so why did Allah make Jews? <laughs> he hates them so much. You know, <laughs> why is he why did he even create them? 
Um, same thing with like all of these things that are hated, gay people, dogs, pigs, like the devil, like why isn't he all powerful and you know why why did he make all these kuffar how did why are the kuffar powerful why are the kuffar killing the muslims the victims you know what doesn't make any sense um but i got similar answers to you with you know it's just the way it is and you can't question too much and um in fact questioning too much in my case was punished you know it was like I say in my book, my critical thinking was considered a sin, you know, like questioning is a, is, is coming from the devil. They considered it waswasa in your ear, like the devil's whispering in your ear, like to question these things when you should just accept them and, and move on with your life. But yeah, we all had that cognitive dissonance. I think I especially had it with hijab because I thought of myself as a feminist I believed that I was a feminist um, and I just ignored the fact that I was wearing, you know, this misogynist piece of clothing and um, pretended that I still was. All right. So um, you talked a bit about the gender inequalities and men in the Muslim community are incredibly sexist. And as I've, you know, with many of my ex-Muslim friends, we realized that even when men leave Islam, quite often they hang on to their, their sexist tendencies just because it's so ingrained in them. And there's really no reason for them to let go of it. It serves them. Uh, they're at the top of that food chain. Um, so my, you know, I would say, you know, it's kind of a good thing being a lesbian woman that you wouldn't have to deal with men like that. You wouldn't have to try to find a husband within that bunch when you were a Muslim, of course. Um, but you had it actually way worse than dealing with sexist men because um, anyone from the LGBT community in the Muslim world is, or from a Muslim community, not necessarily even in the Muslim world, is is suffering greatly i don't know what it's like obviously like in my book i said i know what it's like to have you know the hell of being born a muslim the hell the double hell of being born a muslim girl but i don't know the triple hell of being born a, a, a muslim lesbian woman um but i would assume that growing up with all of the homophobia i don't know if you heard it as much as i did um, if it was as normalized as it was in your home, as it was in mine, or when you were in Morocco. Um, but if it was, then I would assume that you would have gone through some sort of journey of overcoming maybe some kind of self-hate or something like that. So tell us about, tell us about that experience. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that I, I struggled with, I guess, coming to terms with my sexuality because it kind of clashed with my religion, you know? Um, in Islam, <laughs> being a homosexual isn't allowed. It's, uh, it's, you can get imprisoned if you're lucky or you can get thrown off a building. Just very common things that happen. And I knew, I knew about the punishments. Obviously, I, I wouldn't be subject to those punishments here in the United States, but it's just like, it's not only about the actual punishments that they that there are within Islamic theocracies. It's also about the cultural influence of Islam and how if you outlaw homosexuality within the religion, it feeds into the rest of the culture and just gives you a culture of homophobia. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 dangerous to be gay in an Islamic theocracy. Um, I, I would even say that it's more dangerous for for. For males, like to be a gay man in a in a in a um, Islamic theocracy, and I would say for me personally, um, the way I like to describe it is: for a good portion of my life, I was in this state of internalized homophobia. Mm -hmm. I knew I knew I was gay, and I use gay for as synonymously synonymously with lesbian. Um, I knew I was gay, uh, but I I didn't really act on it. And in my head, I always intended on marrying a man because that was the only option. That was my future as a Muslim woman. Um, and I couldn't disappoint my family. I couldn't lose my family. 
So I, I repressed that, that part of myself for, for quite some time. And it wasn't really until I left uh, Islam that I truly came out. So I came out, I guess, as a gay, a gay Muslim at first, mm-hmm. or like a bi Muslim at that t- time, because in my head, I always um, saw myself marrying a man, but I didn't really truly come out and accept my sexuality until I had left religion, because now that cognitive dissonance was gone. Now I was finally being true to myself. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I like to, <laughs> I like to describe it as I had internalized homophobia. I, that, that's really the best way I can describe it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can, I can totally understand that, you know, having had internalized misogyny for so long, I can sort of, I can sort of understand that. And when you talked about sort of accepting that you would marry a man and that that would just be your life, I was thinking to myself, like, my God, like if I had to just, if I were living in some, you know, upside down world where I had to pretend that I was gay, even though I am straight. And I had to be like, yep, I'm going to have to just marry a woman and make that work. (laughs) Like it would just be, you know, you're made, that's like a life sacrifice, you know, like that's a, that's a, that's like, that's no part of you is not being sacrificed at that point. Like that's your entire being. Um, And as I was having that thought, I was having a simultaneous thought of how I did dehumanize myself and degrade myself as well. Anyway, when I accepted to wear niqab and I accepted to wear the man or to marry the man that they forced me to marry. And I accepted that as a Muslim woman, I'm less intelligent than a Muslim man because there's a hadith that says so. And I accepted that my husband can beat me and I accepted that my husband can rape me. So we, it's like the... It's like the edicts of the religion supersede our own uh, humanity for ourselves, even. Like we're we're willing to dehumanize ourselves for this religion. Yeah, it's it really hits home with this because it's like I I had to repress that that side of myself in an effort to to preserve my future with my family because my family is important to me. And it's just, I start thinking a little bit deeper on this in that how, how has Islam, how has this religion interfered with my life? And I start thinking about my Moroccan culture and I I love being Moroccan. I love Mm -hmm. my Moroccan culture. Like I (laughs) absolutely like I, I, I'm proud to say like I'm a Moroccan American. I, when people ask me like where I'm from, I was born in the United States, but my parents are Moroccan and it's just like, I guess this navigating around criticizing the, um, the negative components of your culture, but also valuing the good side of your culture. And it's just like, it's hard to balance that out. Cause it's like, yes, I, I, I um, Morocco is great. Like, in my opinion, if you visit Morocco or you, if you visit Moroccans, you're going to get possibly the best hospitality in the world. But it's just like, at the same time, I need to be critical of the negative aspects. There is homophobia, there is gender inequality, and I'm, I'm not willing to let that go. And I, I always like to describe this as I'm very nuanced. I don't hate Islamic countries. I don't hate Islam. I don't, or I do <laughs> hate Islamic ideology. I don't hate Muslims. Mm-hmm. All of my family are Muslims. But I love, I love Moroccan culture. I love Arab culture. I love speaking to Arabs. I, mm-hmm. I love learning more about other cultures within the MENA region. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's a little tough to navigate around this when Islam is so intertwined with all of these countries. Yes, but, you know, when you criticize your American side, for example, do you feel the need to make that same nuanced argument and to say just because I'm criticizing you know the American government currently or our uh, you know school shoot the latest school shooting or whatever it is that you're criticizing that has to do with American politics or culture or whatever um, you don't have to explain that you love America and that you love being American Mm -hmm. 
you it's it's understood that when you're criticizing your country, it's because you love it and you want it to be better. And you're trying mm -hmm. to pick out the garbage so that it can, you know, it can be, it can progress into the future into a more, you know, into a better place. Um, but but we just feel this knee-jerk reaction to constantly do that when it comes from when you're because Morocco or Egypt or whatever other country we happen to be from. Um, and I, it took me a while to stop feeling sort of apologetic about that. You know, I'm not, I don't, I don't need to tell you that I love Egypt. I don't need to tell you that I love Arab culture, because if you're going to assume that because I'm criticizing this ideology that overtook these cultures and that enslaved the women in those cultures if you're going to interpret that as me hating those people then that's a you problem you know like mm -hmm. it, it really bothers me that people think that because we're speaking up against the hijab or because we're speaking up against the misogyny or the honor culture or the violence or all of these things it's because we hate muslims are you kidding mm -hmm. me like that's the exact opposite of hating muslims if we hated muslims we'd be like get past the popcorn let the shia and muslim keep or shia and sunnis keep killing each other let those women continue to be covered in burqas and forced <laughs> at home and not be allowed to go to school you know you know I, i'm actually really glad you mentioned that because an acquaintance from mine or an acquaintance of mine actually um, was surprised when I expressed concern for um, for Shia's being killed, um, and I and I asked him like who's who who did this attack? What's going on? This is this isn't right. And to that he replied, "I thought you hated all Muslims." And I was like, "Oh gosh, no, no, that's." Just because I, I I don't agree with Islamic ideology does not mean I hate Muslims. They conflate uh, mm. criticism of Islam with discrimination against Muslims. I don't mm. want people to be killed. <laughs> I, I don't want anyone to like be you killed. You have to explain this. Like, I, like you have to clarify. Oh, no, I don't want innocent <laughs> people to be murdered. In fact, like, <laughs> just, be, just because I don't want gays thrown off roofs, just because I don't want, I want, I don't want um, um, apostates in prison does not mean that I hate the people. The people can do whatever they want, just mm -hmm. not hurt other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and it really sucks because I've, I've gotten called an Islamophobe quite a few times by, by my American friends. And I'm just like, I, I, I'm trying to help make the world a better place, a more equal place a place where everyone has human rights and it's it's disheartening to to see those responses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah to to put it mildly um so you're getting these criticisms of criticisms of islamophobia i've i've heard you say that before um but you are a fierce fierce advocate for free speech i've read a few articles where you've you've talked about how important it is to you. Um, obviously, this news of what happened to Salman Rushdie, we chatted a little bit about that before our call and how much it's affected both of us. Um, and of course, that the crux of that whole tragedy is free expression, free speech. That's the thing that the, the terrorists that... Um, or the terrorist that stabbed him. That's the thing that he's vehemently against. Um, can you tell me if there was a particular experience with you that caused you to become such a strong supporter of, of free expression or is it just, it just made sense to you just as an American? I, I don't think there was one particular thing. I, I really think it was just a million different things put together. Um, I, the way I, I kind of see this, I've, I've always valued equality. Um, just as I told you with my childhood, seeing that inequality uh, made me uncomfortable. Um, so I guess when I 
when I started to read more, reading your book, reading Masi Alinejad's book, and doing more research and learning that that woman in Iran can't ride a bike. The Iranian mm. people in the Islamic Republic of Iran, you can't sing and dance in public. Reading that type of thing and then seeing campaigns like Masi Ali Najad's White Wednesdays, seeing women walk on the street with their waving their hijab mm -hmm. in the air proudly, knowing that they could get punished and they probably will get punished for that. Yeah. That was the difference. If, if those women, if those men and women that are advocating in those Islamic theocracies can stand up for what they believe in, can stand up for human rights, the least I can do is speak from the safety of America. The least I could do is defend their rights. I, I see it more as my responsibility to use my voice than, than me doing something that's not expected. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. That's so beautiful. And that's a similar trajectory to mine and to our mutual hero, Ayan. She said, you know, I don't want to, it's not like I do this because I enjoy it. You know, I'm compelled to do this. We feel like, you know, we are privileged enough to be living in a free country. Now, obviously there's risks. What happened in New York to Sir Salman Rushdie, you know, underscores the fact that there are serious risks to being public um but we do still have a responsibility when we're living in a free country to speak out because despite those risks it is impossible for somebody in Somalia or in Saudi Arabia or in Sudan or in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or in 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 like practically 50 different Muslim majority countries and because there are so many voices that are silenced we have to you know we we like Ayan said we're we're compelled to do this and I absolutely applaud you for that because we're talking about this like um we have to understand the gravity of making that decision. There's a reason why most people, even in the West, don't make that same decision that you made. You mentioned Masi, and we also talked about, right before this call, we talked about how she had an Iranian man from the Iranian National Guard with an AK-47 sitting in a car in front of her house, stalking her. Um, and this poor woman has already been under FBI surveillance so many times because of the fact that she's had stalkers before. Her brother has been imprisoned. I mean, she's gone through so much. They have tried so hard to silence her. And she is just like beyond human, phenomenal, amazing woman. And she still keeps talking. She will not let them win. Um, but people like Masi are not common. You know, she she the reason why we're talking about her right now is because she's such an amazing human being. Most people say, hey, you know, I need to live my life. I want to be alive for my children. I want to see my grandchildren. I want to live a quiet life. And they just live in the free Western world and forget about their life before. So you know, I do want to say to you, I know, I understand that it's, you feel it's your responsibility and I, and I understand that you feel you're compelled to do it, but you do absolutely deserve to be applauded for that, to be um, appreciated that you're taking that risk and that you're putting your face and your name and your voice out there. And I really feel that people like you and Masi and everybody else who speaks out like that That's the only way to stop the people who have been, you know, beheading teachers, stabbing writers, killing journalists. They, what are they going to do? Kill us all? Are they going to stab all of us? You know, the more of us that speak up, the more we spread the risk and the safer we all are. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for you for doing this. 
And like Salman Rushdie said, when they try to make you shut up, you just sing louder. Thank you. Um, so speaking of Ion, so uh, you are working with an organization that's very close to my heart as well, the Ion Hersiali Foundation. Can you tell us about the work that you do with that foundation and also maybe tell us about the courses that you took with Ion at the University of Austin? Is that what it's called? Okay, great. So please tell us about those experiences. Yeah, so I can I can first start by telling everyone what the Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation, otherwise known as AHA Foundation, is. Um, and it's basically a nonprofit that works to protect women from honor violence, genital mutilation, and forced marriage. And the forced marriage even goes to child marriage and include child marriage as well. Um, and this organization has an overall emphasis on liberty for all. And what I'm part of is their Critical Thinking Fellowship, which is a program for students um, that works to nurture critical thinking on uh, U.S. college campuses. And through this program, I've been able to host a couple of cool events. Uh, the first event I did was with Masi Al-Najad, focusing on women's rights in Iran. And in that event, Faisal uh, Saeed Al-Mutar uh, interviewed her. Uh, the second event I actually did was with Ion, um, focusing on free speech on college campuses. And the my most recent event was with Sarah Hader, which is the uh, founder, co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America. And that one focused on free speech and the Islamophobia narrative. So through this, through this program, I've been able to speak up on these issues that I'm truly passionate about. And I, I, I highly value this, this opportunity and I'm very appreciative for the AHA Foundation. Wonderful. And you, yeah, you also and then asked Austin. about- Austin, yeah. Austin, so I yeah. one of your professors there. Yeah, yeah. So. For those of you who don't know, the University of Austin, or for short, UATX, um, is a new initiative. There are, um, it's founded by quite a few people. I guess um, the biggest one I can remember right now is Barry Weiss. Um, and it was founded to um, uphold the principles of uh, the fearless pursuit of truth. Um, it basically goes on the premise of that on our college campuses and broadly in our general, I guess, culture right now, uh, we can't really freely play with words and ideas. We can't really have open conversations that um, allow us to learn more and to get to the bottom of the truth. And what this initiative is, is basically um, a new university that will create an environment for students to actually pursue truth in an open environment. Um, and they had this uh, summer program that I was recently at called Forbidden Courses. And within this program, I was in Ion's course, which focused on critical thinking and freedom of expression. And um, it was, I can absolutely tell you, it was absolutely great to be with Ion for a week. Um, she's, she's an amazing person, uh, very funny, very sweet. Um, and it was it was great to learn from her. We we learned about um, argumentation and fallacies, and we were able to have great discussion and debates, and learn about um, learn about the process of having conversations and having debates and uh, finding fallacies. Um, but one thing that I will touch on because I am mentioning Ion is that throughout this whole process, she did have security. She did have armed security. And that's that's the cold hard truth of what it means to be an activist in this realm. Mm -hmm. When you speak up about these things, your life is at risk. There's a reason that that I haven't had that security. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's it is it is very upsetting to see that. Um I remember when she was pregnant and you know seeing her with like security coming to like check the restaurant before she comes in and stuff like that and you just feel like it's just you just want to do anything like as she's so graceful she's so she's like this i mean i i think she's like this ethereal queen i absolutely adore her um and it just breaks your heart it just shatters your heart to see 
that she has to live like this because she's trying to speak the truth because she's trying to talk about her experience and she's trying to help others and this is this is how she has to live her life fear for herself and fear for her children yeah um i think after what happened with salman rishdi yesterday a lot of us are really shaken up um I can see in the comments here that people are talking about how upset they were about it, upset we still are because he, um, we still don't know if he's going to be okay. We got some really dark news from his agent that, um, yeah, his prognosis may not be that great. So we're hoping all the best for him. All right, I am going to open it up to everybody that is here to chat with you today, Hannah. So I can see some familiar faces. Mars is here, your buddy Mars. I've seen so many pictures with the two of you. Mars, were you at the Forbidden Courses as well? I really wish that I was. Like, um, Hannah and I talked a lot about it and I, Hannah, I gotta tell you, I was so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> But on um, the plus side is I, I got to meet Barry Weiss a few weeks afterwards. So, um, you know, we, we talked we talked a little bit about the UITX, but like, you know, I, I was really happy for you that, that, that you got to be there. It's like, but oh, I wanted to be there. Yeah. So so Mars wasn't there, but from the amount I talked to him and pictures and videos. He and got just, it for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's smart, actually. Well done. <laughs> Well, actually, well, it was it was fully uh, expense paid, so oh, okay. it was yeah, it was for free for me as well. It was well, free but... anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but he, I at least got to share a lot with him, so he was he was living vicariously. Oh, okay, that's cool. Hopefully, they'll have another one of these sessions run again, and then maybe Mars can join, and anybody else who was unable to. All right, so I see quite a few people here who are um, were one of my forgotten feminists in the past. So it's so great to see you, Aaliyah, Neda, Michelle, Leora, Sahara. Welcome to you all. Um, if anybody has anything that they want to say to Hannah, just go ahead and unmute yourself. I can see that you have Graham. Did you want to say something to Hannah? Sure. Hannah, great to hear your accounts of your life and your the evolution of your thinking and so on. Um, I, I just have a question um, that's related to the difference between the generations, first generation immigrants and second generation immigrants. Um, I live up here in Canada and we have quite a large uh, in-migration from uh, South Asia, from the Middle East, from Iran and so on. A lot of these are first generation immigrants. Uh, a lot of those people have views that you find are very common in Morocco and perhaps among your parents' generation in the US. One of the things that gives us pause, some of us who have a sort of a liberal, um, socially liberal approach to what a society should be like, tolerant, multicultural, but uh, respectful of women's rights and so on. One of the concerns is that the more people that come in from socially and religiously very, very conservative countries, it, it might shift the sort of average um, degree of liberalism in the society towards a more socially conservative uh, view. And that, that could come out in women's rights and family law and so on, it might increase the voting for socially very conservative or re religiously oriented parties and so on. So th that's a bit of a worry. Now, the, the possibly bright side of this is that the second generation, the people who are the sons and daughters of those first generation immigrants, um, if they go through a, a secular or largely secular school system and they meet people who are not 
you know, fundamentalist Christians or fundamentalist Muslims or whatever. Um, they're, they're learning to interact with people with other kinds of ways of looking at the world and looking at human rights and so on. And they, I, you know, you're a fantastic example of the possibilities for, you know, a daughter of a first generation, presumably socially conservative parents to, to become, you know, what you are and what we all admire in you. So I hope that that's the future of societies that have large numbers of these first generation socially and religiously conservative people coming in that the second or at least the third generation of their kids is not like that. And that, but so to summarize all that in a question to you, you know a lot of this, uh, of these second generation uh, sort of immigrant kids, grown up immigrant kids of immigrant parents. Um, you know a lot of those people. Probably some of them have sort of freed themselves from that old, ancient, conservative, religiously fundamentalist ideology. Maybe some of them haven't. What's your perception of the second generation from the people that you know? Are they actually migrating into a more liberal uh, sort of um, perspective of the kind that you have? Thank you, Graham, for asking that question. I, I actually thought of something really important that I wanted to touch on because of it. Um, and I think that the way I see this is that there are multiple directions that they could go in. Um, they could go in my direction and just like denounce the religion in, in its totality and just start just, or start criticizing it. Um, or from what I've seen, something else that I've seen is that they, they keep the religion. Um, they still consider this, themselves Muslims, um, but they continue to live, live their lives. So it's that um, they engage in that, I guess, the American culture of debauchery, of sin, of going out, drinking, having premarital sex, uh, smoking, any other potential sin, but they're still uh, Muslim at the end of the day. And to each their own, if that's, if that's how you want to follow the religion, cool. But what bothers me is that it's these same people that prevent any type of criticism against Islam. It's these same people that uh, once you start to say any any type of thing will prevent you from from talking and call you an Islamophobe. And that's where my problem with it is. If if that's how you want to live your life, cool, good for you. I'm a live and let live type of person. But if if you are here in the Ameri if the, if you are here in the United States, if you are in the in the West, if you are in these European countries, and you are enjoying these rights, you are enjoying these freedoms, and you are preventing the rest of us from speaking out on what it is truly like to be a homosexual, an apostate, or any any other uh, any other thing in the Islamic theocracies. If you're preventing that, then you are. Uh, I don't even know, then that's, that's, that's really bad. I, uh, it's just that, that's what bothers me. It's like, you can have them go in two directions. It's, and I guess that's, that's what I've seen. It's, it's from these same second generation, I guess, Muslims that some of them have, or I guess, um, second generation immigrants, or I, I don't know how you, uh, worded it, um, that some of these have called me an Islamophobe for criticizing Islam. Um, and these are the same people that are enjoying the rights and freedoms of the United States. You're going out, you're, you're sinning, you're, and uh, cool, you still call yourself a Muslim. You can do whatever you want, but it's just, I'm, what, what I'm, the reason why I'm speaking up is for a purpose. I want, I want other people in other countries to enjoy the same freedoms that you are uh, enjoying. Um, Hannah, if I am to interject, I, I've gone through the same situation where if I am to speak about my experiences and how difficult and um, just the trauma, the religious trauma that I've gone through, I, I got called an Islamophobe a lot. And the problem is there is a lot of identity politics and not um, separating 
the problem itself from the people. And that just because we criticize an ideology, it doesn't mean that we criticize or that we're discriminating against the people themselves. So maybe a critical thing, maybe an important thing to do is to teach people the importance of critical thinking, the importance of separating the identity politics from the people themselves. Yeah, that's, sorry. No, that's okay. I just wanted to to actually make sure that Graham was happy with your response if we were okay to move on to the next comment. And I also, go ahead, Graham. Um, Hannah, Hannah, your your response, your what what you recounted is very poignant, and it's um, it it's sort of amazing in a way. But in any, just just a, a little bit of follow up. Um, Ayan Hersielli, when she was in Somalia, and one of the things she observed is that um, the 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 older people, the, the parents, were often um, Muslim in a very kind of traditionalist, non-literalist kind of way. They would go to the mosque, the imam would mumble a few prayers, they'd go back, they'd, you know, they'd observe the required holidays and so on, but they weren't, they weren't, um, you know, they, they weren't looking at, at the Quran chapter and verse. And what she observed is that there was, there was an increasing flow of fundamentalist preachers coming in from um, Saudi Arabia and other places. And what they were saying to young people in Somalia, they're basically radicalizing them by saying, oh, your parents don't really know Islam. What you need to do is go back and look at the book itself. Look at the, the Quran and its passages and the Hadith and take it seriously. And that that kind of focus on um, the text, that ancient, you know, 1300-year-old text, this is what was used to radicalize a lot of the young people. And she, she thought this was, you know, she, she herself was initially radicalized by that, and it took her a long time to work her way out of that. So, so uh, the younger generation wasn't necessarily growing up more liberal. They were growing up, if anything, more radical. Now, what you described... And that's what I was going to... I wanted to just say that there is a third option here, and you're sure. just about to talk about it. That's the third option, is they do become more radicalized because they hang on to their identity even more when they're outside of the Muslim world. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I was speaking from my personal experience. I haven't really encountered... Uh, people to be that become more radicalized. I've just encountered um, people that seek to protect um, their community. Um, and it it kind of goes a little a little bit further than that. And there's something else that I, I wanted to mention in that um, it's it's not just I guess it, it's multidimensional. You have you have I guess these I guess the way you termed it, Graham, is the second generation Muslims um, that are engaging in American culture, um, enjoying their rights, but also seeking to protect their religion in the sense of preventing any type of discrimination, um, even when it's very much warranted. Uh, you have that dimension of it, and then you also have the dimension of how is the West react, reacting? How are the other, how is the political field reacting? How is especially something that really hit me is how is the, the gay community reacting? And I, for me, it was, it was kind of the way I like to term it is it's like a betrayal by the West. Like it was just, it, you, you didn't expect it. Like you, you leave Islam and you start to speak up about how so many practices are misogynistic, they're sexist, they're homophobic, they're transphobic, there's et cetera, there's a million things. And <laughs> they tell you that you're not allowed to say that. They tell you that we need to protect our Muslim brothers and sisters. And it's, it's insulting because, hey, I'm the one that really has Muslim brothers and sisters. Every single one of my family members is a Muslim. 
I'm not trying to hurt them. I'm not trying to insult them. I'm just criticizing a religion that's leading to these awful practices. And I guess that's, that's just troublesome for me. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was laughing at Paula's comment, but I, I wasn't like minimizing what you were saying. Sorry, Paula just made me laugh. Um, but no, I completely agree with what you're saying. And I completely agree with what Graham was saying. And I completely agree with what Neda was, was saying as well about the importance of, of separating the, the people from the ideology. But there are quite a few people in the chat here that are commenting that, you know, I think I'm going to read the one from Leora, because I think that's, that's really poignant. And she was basically saying that being an immigrant, you know, third generation, fourth generation, it's not going to make a difference. The teachings are in the Quran. The one who convinced my brother to join ISIS was a Canadian convert. So I think that's a, a really poignant point there, Leora. Thank you yeah. for making it. Did you want to expand on it? Well, it's it's more because uh, you were asking about the uh, immigrants in Canada. Since I live in Canada, I'm going to speak about it. I encountered a lot of them who were supporting ISIS and all the jihadis until this day. Just two days ago, um, I saw an immigrant from a country that was sharing an Islam, that she was um, helping her her son read the Quran or he was in a school, Islamic school, and he was reading uh, Surat al-Masad. And I don't know if anyone knows Surat al-Masad. And I complained about it and I told, the, I told you guys in the group that no one is supposed to teach a child such violence at an age like that. He was only 10 years old. So as long as these verses are still there, nothing is going to change. They need, I think they need to be abolished. That's the only way. Yeah, I, I'm, our... I'm, glad, I'm glad you touch on that because another, another dimension of, of this is how are we reacting to those verses? Are we even allowed to criticize them? Um, because as you said, the verses are always going to be there. It's, you can't really get rid of them. But what you can do is expand the ability to criticize them, expand the ability to be able to speak freely about them. And that's that's where I really see my role as, as being here in America. It's realizing that um, we don't really talk about these things here because of, because of political correctness, it's not really allowed. And I think it's it's truly important to, to work, I guess, as, as a... Um, I believe it was um, Neda, I'm not sure who, who mentioned it, um, that we need to expand critical thinking and just, mm -hmm. I guess, educate in the sense of like, hey, there are things that are taught that are really right. And it, it can't be about cultural relativism, because at the end of the day, there are standards, there are human rights. I don't care what your religion is. I'm going to uphold human rights regardless. That's perfect. That's going to be a Thank you, Hannah. All right, so um, let's move on to Erkan. You had a comment for Hannah? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Right, well, first of all, thanks, Hannah, for a really interesting discussion again. Um, I, I, what I was going to say comes back to the free expression, the point about free expression, and it's a Kind of a segue from sort of what um, Graham and what Le Leora were, were, were both saying, and I think you know progressives in the West, obviously they you know they represent Western values, enlightenment, the scientific method. They represent these values as being like a juggernaut that wants to flatten everything else, uh, that wants to dominate everything else, and it occurs to me. It occurs to me that precisely the reverse is true. You know, what Western values find themselves up against are values on the other side of the world, be it communism and socialism, or be it Islamism, that are eternal, aggressive, um, unchallengeable, you know, unassailable, right? Um, and and um, and seek world domination. Literally, do seek to dominate the world. And um, you, but you can't snap a progressive out of this delusion. It seems like they just they have they're fixated on they're fixated on 
bringing down what they see as the ultimate evil and they don't actually understand their own culture. You know, it's like, not only do they not understand Islam and not only do they not truly understand socialism, communism as it's practiced in certain countries we could mention, they don't actually understand their own culture. They, they, don't, they don't understand the, the delicate nature of Western values, the things that we all benefit from. And um, I think, uh, yeah, this is this is that this is the a case of like uh, I forget who mentioned it now, but being liberal at home and conservative overseas, right? It's you know, like you said before, it's kind of like the soft bigotry of low expectations as well. Like you know, people on people people with brown skin or people on the other side of the world, they don't know any better, so it's, it, it just plays into those kinds of stereotypes and. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I wonder what you think about that. It's just like, um, there's like a kind of vindictive protectiveness over these kinds of, I think sociologists, that's what sociologists call it. And I wonder what you think about that really. Hannah, sorry. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this is something that really infuriates me. And I really think, um, Sarah Hader explains this well, so I'll, I'll use her explanation. Um, she describes this as, I guess, in the West or, or the people that are failing to see this. It's a situation where they don't realize that a marginalized community can also be an oppressor. They don't realize the oppressed can be the oppressor. Um, that's, that's one way um, that you can look at this. Or they, in fact, they do realize that there are these, these bad things, but they, they choose to approach it with the more pros and cons of that if we do speak up about these things, then Muslims are going to be discriminated against. And I think that's absolutely ridiculous. I think when we see those types of situations where you see progressives that are realizing that there are issues but are preventing dialogue, preventing speech because of potential discrimination, I think that's ridiculous. I think that human rights should be upheld regardless. I think that we should, we should fight for equality. We should advocate for everyone. And this protectionism effort is ridiculous. I fully agree, yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, Sahara. You're muted. Maybe you're not there. Sarah had her hand up. Um, so actually, uh, Jin Dahi, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but I would love for you to tell us if you're comfortable turning on your uh, microphone. Yeah, I'm reading your comment here where you said you had many gifts for being able to recite the Quran and as an adult, you just burned all those gifts. Tell us about that. Yeah. Where were you? I uh, love that. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I'm French spoken, but I, uh, I understand English. I speak Arabic as well. Well, when I was a young girl in Algeria, that we, mm -hmm. we start learning at four years old. So it's uh, you just have to recite. And when I was 12, I have a big celebration for that. <laughs> yeah. So of course, after that, we have to read it so, because it's at school too. So I have it at secondary university. We start classes with it. Even if I wasn't in a, like, a, let's say, my family wasn't that much radical in mm -hmm. Islam. My dad grew up in France, so we were lucky in Azure. Plus I'm Berber, so we weren't, uh, we must most of us are agnostic, so we, we're lucky, but mm -hmm. we have to do it at school. So I find it very interesting when I grew up, I read it, the whole book, and I was like to say to my dad, this is what I have, gift for those books. So mm. I said, no way, I can keep those ones. Beautiful gifts, of course, as you know, for girls, they have big mm. celebration even for Ramadan. For uh, And I see it here, the, uh, because you were mentioning generation, uh, I am in my second immigration. Of course, I immigrated to France during the black decades we all suffer from in Algeria, as women, as girls, as students, uh, from 1982 to 90, let's say 2000. 
people say it stopped in 1999, but let's say 2000. Uh, so I see it in France. Or Can I just interrupt you for, for one moment? And yeah. if you could just give us a little bit of background about this black decade, because I don't know if everybody on the oh, call is familiar with uh, it. That's where, where I heard uh, your name. Sorry, I, I never read your books. I was reading an article about the HUC here in Montreal that put a picture of uh, uh, a woman student wearing hijab from Algeria. So we have a big debate right now on that thing. Mm -hmm. And we didn't like it. So the newspaper is writing about it because it's a big, um, uh, let's say, uh, a big challenge for uh, the women, especially for my generation, all Algerian who moved in other countries because of mm -hmm. that. So yeah. we were really not surprised, but really deceived. And yeah. let's say um, it's because uh, the 10 years, as you know, we had this party, Muslim, Muslim party, the, the leader came from United, United Kingdom and he won, like legally he won the, the, the election because uh, he started by feeding people. He opened like a, mm -hmm. a small, you know, when feed the people, angry people are hungry people are angry people. So when you yeah. feed them, they become, uh, they, they take a party to the one who feed them. So with, they open, let's say, even in big cities, they start with villages, but after that, they move to big city. I came from the city close to Hana country, Morocco, uh, Oran, which is, we have uh, nice food, like you mentioned in the beginning earlier, we similar food as Morocco. So they start like that for the first year, and we were under like army, um, uh, control even uh, before the the coming of this leader it was very uh, Abbas if I'm I forget his name but we don't forget what he did um, Abbas Madan if I'm not wrong he was very famous in Algeria the first leader of Al uh, Qaeda and all those groups and he started feeding uh, the families so when it comes to the day of the voting as you know women can just sign for the man to go and for sure the man will vote for this party so all the voices of the women went to that party too the same as what happened let's say in iran when all women thought they're gonna have a nice uh, things and they vote for khomeini and they didn't suspect him to put we have the same situation so um the politics encouraged the uh, that party because they were scared. You can't take it off because the people will still uh, uh, fidel to him. And uh, they start uh, talking in the media, big, uh, huge ceremony in the stadium. So that's how they, they won the election. And since that, we suffered a lot because they were throwing acid to girls, our students at this time on the our faces um, like it was a wear hijab uh, i was athlete so we still had we were we were having a lot of uh, letters you have to stop wearing shorts you have to do this uh, we stand we stood sorry we stood for that even in this country so when we see that here uh, women are going back to that it scare us let's say like that the world so yeah. if you have a chance, you can read. I can I can post it here. It's in French, but uh, it's HOC. It's a famous uh, institution. It's supposed to be like, and they post a picture of that. Uh, and don't get me wrong. I have nothing against the person or the picture, but it's the, the symbol that they show. And they say, we want the woman to be uh, free. We are like, yes, we want Islam. Uh, women wearing hijab in the other countries to be free to go to school and to learn even wearing hijab it's because they don't have choice but doing here it's it's a big uh, i think we're not finished with that it happened last uh, last week so that's why i joined you here because i was curious to hear about uh, what you're gonna say but yeah. uh, i i hope that uh, you will send me uh, details about the lunch book here in montreal Yes. I will yeah. write all my <laughs> well, Yes. Yes, I'll yeah. subscribe and to my website to add, and you'll get all the information. Yeah. Just to add um, what Hannah mentioned, I think if uh, this freedom we have here, that 
I find there is a weakness on it because of that we have having these things coming here. And I think we should be careful because this is what's happening right now in France. And it's, it's real. I was there. Even my friends, they, they can't go out without having trouble when they live in uh, the suburb of uh, Paris. So I think if we don't control it now, it may happen same as in French. And like I mentioned on the yeah. chat, now we're in it is not a, like a symbol of religion, it's identity. It's mm -hmm. a symbol of identity. Many girls wear it just to make it hard for politics. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you touched on it. And um, I, I really look at this, this whole thing through the, the I guess, the lens of the West. Um, my thing is, it always goes back to the education aspect. My thing is, is, is first being able to speak about these issues and being able to educate the, the American, I, I'm speaking from an American perspective, but just the West in its totality that like, hey, if a woman is wearing a hijab, that doesn't mean she necessarily chose that for herself. And regardless if she's wearing it, we should be able to criticize the Islam. And that doesn't mean we're criticizing her as a Muslim um, in that explaining this nuance to others because the amount of people that really conflate um, anti-Muslim bigotry and criticism of Islam is ridiculous. And I, and I, I do see these things that like, um, especially, uh, I, I believe you just said the Algerian woman, the hijab in uh, in a, was it an advertisement you said? Or in Canada. So women escape mm -hmm. Algeria where they're being killed, where mm -hmm. they're getting acid thrown in their faces. Women are escaping Iran where they're being thrown in prison. And they come to Canada to find hijab plastered all over everything. That's the betrayal that, that she was referencing. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It just goes back how part of me wants to say that people don't understand. People are just lacking in knowledge of what these things could potentially mean. But another part of me says that the people that are doing this just don't care and that they just, they just want to promote their version of diversity. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really disheartening for me to, to hear experiences like that of someone who's escaped the black decade and to come and see that or like to, to be able to see that that's just ridiculous that's not fair and you should be able to voice your opinion about that but instead I, I hate to say it but you, you're not you're not allowed to you're not going to get if, if you voice your opinion about that the left is just going to come at you and the right honestly sometimes is is no better they just feed off of that and it's just like we're we're kind of stuck in the middle of um of this i guess this advocacy where the only option we have is to speak to um i guess news media on the right because they're the only ones that are willing to hear us out i i would love to speak to an organization on the left i would i would speak to any organization that's willing to let me express these concerns but it's just that I just I, I see the left right now is just so one sided and unwilling to see another perspective on this topic. I agree. And I also agree with you when you said that they just don't care. And I think that if that's what it boils down to. It's never going to bother me. It's never going to hurt me. It's never going to hurt my daughters. It's never going to hurt my sister. It's never going to hurt my mother. So not my problem. That's their problem. I get to look inclusive and diverse. Um, Mars. Well, I have a question for um, both you, Yasmin, and for Hannah. Um, sometimes I, you know, one of the things I do on the site is I, do, I've been hosting discussions with people about like what's going on here in, um, you know, the U.S. and our sister um, liberal democracies, especially with the in, with the infiltration of CSJ and um, uh, critical race theory. There's a um, when they talk about diversity you now, they are willing to go so far as to um, let in people into Western countries that, although they might be of different skin colors, they might have 
they might be take, coming, bringing in values that are inherently conservative and kind of corrosive to the kind of liberal social fabric we have here in the States that honors all people of different skin colors, sexual, sexual orientations, what have you. And it's just not good for the, for the progress we've made as a people up to this point. Um, I've, when I talk to people now, I tell, I, I usually tell people that I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in building a multi-ethnic community, but not a multicultural one. Um, that having said that there are things from other cultures that do, that do enhance what we have here in the West, um, in, in, in certain ways, but we don't we obviously don't want to um, incorporate all kinds of cultural values like it's like you know homophobia is the most obvious one off the top of my head right now like what do you think the stopping point is between um saying i should respect your culture and and um there's something you have to offer but this is a hard no here in the states i mean i think richard dawkins was asked that in, in, in an interview once and he he actually told the interview the interview online to hell with your culture this is what we do here we don't do that we don't we don't we don't honor something that discriminates against someone on those on that basis here in the west what do you think the hard stopping point is my answer is very short so i'll let uh yasmin dive a little bit deeper into this but my thing is I, I I don't care what culture when religion is considered within culture as well, but what culture you follow, what religion you follow. Um, I draw the line when it comes to human rights. It's as simple as that. There, I, when it comes to human rights, there is no cultural relevant relativism. It's if you're not willing to uphold human rights, if you're if you're discriminating against others, if you are are being pernicious to others, then that's where I draw the line. And it, it that's that's something that I I'm very adamant about. I'm like I really would die on this hill that it comes to human rights. If 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 you're not willing to fight if you're not willing to uphold these human rights, then I'm sorry, then what are you doing here? The what about you, Yasmin? I have nothing to add to that. I like your short and sweet answer. That was that was well said. We already have a universal declaration of human rights. You know, we've already agreed on what we believe uh, are human rights. Some people disagreed with that universal declaration and they decided to make their own, the Cairo Declaration, um, because they could not fathom saying that women were equal or that Jews are equal or that you know, homosexuals are equal, so they created their own. Um, and and I think you're absolutely right. That is the line in the sand right there. And you can't say, but my culture says that I can be <laughs> homophobic or, but my culture says that I can cut off the clitoris of my daughter with a razor blade. I don't fucking care. I'm not interested in what some dusty old book says. I'm not interested in what your imaginary friend heard in a cave. I'm not interested in any of those things. It doesn't matter. It's barbaric. It's wrong. End of discussion. Totally agree with you, Hannah. And I'm just realizing that I did take you over time. <laughs> we were having such a good discussion that uh, I forgot to ask you if you were okay to go a little extra. So thank you so much for, for staying with us for a little bit longer, Hannah. Um, before I let you go, I just wanna make sure that everybody who had something to say had an opportunity to express their voice. Okay, great. And Hannah, was there something that you wanted to say, wanted to add, wanted to plug, wanted to share um, before we say goodbye to you? Uh, yeah, I would. I guess I would absolutely love to plug this organization that I'm part of. Um, it's called Atheists for Liberty. And it's basically uh, Yasmin Mohammed is a, a board of advisor for the organization. And it's basically a really good community that actually listens to these issues 
issues that we as ex-Muslims face because other atheist communities really don't care about ex-Muslims. They're just really about the Christianity aspect and just mm -hmm. fail to include us into this discussion. So Atheists for Liberty is a really cool organization to join. Um, it, the whole premise is about uh, really uh, upholding liberal values um, and it's open to anyone, whether you're uh, Democrat, Republican, uh, whatever, Libertarian, uh, whatever, wherever you fall on the political compass, um, it's just a community to come out and meet people that are willing to actually engage in these conversations. So if you guys want to check out Atheists for Liberty, and Yasmin is actually a board of advisor for the organization. Yes, that's, they are a great organization. Thank you so much for that, Hannah. And thank you everybody for joining us here today. This was a lovely conversation. There's so much going on in the chat and I wish I could have read all of those comments or wish we had time to hear all of them. Um, but obviously that's not possible. But I really wanna thank you all for engaging so passionately in this discussion. And thank you so much, Hannah, for sharing so much of your experience and your story and your insight and your wisdom with us and also for giving us uh, extra time. All right, everyone, thank you again, and we'll see you at the next Forgotten Feminists. Bye, everyone.